Hello everyone, Dennis here. In this video, I'm going to discuss with you GCE O-Level Physics October-November 2023 paper, paper 1. Subject code is 6091. This video is brought to you by Ace with Dennis. Now, learning can be smart, not hard. Also, don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification button to stop missing out free lessons from me. Question 1. A stone is moved from one place to a place where the gravitational field strength is different. What happens to the mass and the weight of the stone? A. Both the mass and the weight of the stone change. B. Both the mass and the weight of the stone stay the same. C. The mass of the stone stays the same, but its weight changes. D. The weight of the stone stays the same, but its mass changes. This question is very straightforward questions if you know the differences between the mass and the weight. So the answer is C. The mass of the stone stays the same, but its weight changes. Let's have a quick recap. What is a mass? A mass is the amount of substance or matter of an object and it does not affect it by gravitational field strength. On the other hand, a weight is the force acting on an object due to gravity. The stronger the strength of gravitational field, the larger the weight. So the formula for the weight is W equals mg. Question 2. What is the unit of pressure expressed in base units? Is it A. Kg meter per second square or B. Kg per meter second or C. Kg per meter second square or D. Kg per second square? The answer is C. Kg per meter second square. So how we can get this answer? Let's look at the formula of pressure, P equals F over A. We know that F equals MA. And the uniform, base unit for mass is kg. And the base unit for A, which is acceleration, is meters per second square. Then we substitute into the formula here. The base unit for force will be kg meter per second square. And the base unit for the area is meter square. Now we can cancel the meter with the meter square at the bottom and the s square here can bring down. At the end we get the base unit for the pressure which is kg per meter second square. Question 3. What are the orders of magnitude for the diameter of the earth and for the diameter of an atom? Here are a few choices for the answer for diameter of earth and diameter of atom. Is it A, 10 gigameters and 0.1 micrometer or B, 10 gigameters and 0.1 nanometers or C, 10 megameters and 0.1 micrometer or D, 10 megameters and 0.1 nanometer. The answer is D, 10 megameters and 0.1 nanometer. So let's have a quick recap about the scientific notation. So we start with kilo K, which is 10 to the power 3, and this value is in thousands. Mega M is 10 to the power 6, which is million. Giga G, which is 10 to the power 9, and the value is between the billion range. So the actual diameter of Earth is 12,000. 742 kilometers. If we change the kilo to the actual value, 1000, so this value becomes 12,742,000 meters and represent it into the scientific notation form, it is about 13 megameters. That's why for the choice here, it is not 10 gigameters but it should be 10 megameters. 
Now, how about the diameter of atom? Now, let's have a quick recap for the small, smaller value. We start with the deci D, which is 10 to the power of negative 1. Centi C, which is 10 to the power of negative 2. Milli M, 10 to the power of negative 3. Micro Mu equals 10 to the power of negative 6. Nano N, 10 to the power of negative 9. And Pico P, 10 to the power of negative 12. So you may wonder if the answer for diameter of atom is 0 0.1 micrometer. Let's see how small is the value of the micrometer range. So the diameter of our hair is about 17 to 181 micrometer. And the actual diameter of an atom is 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 nanometers. So that's why from the answers there, the correct answer should be D. 10 megameters for the diameter of the earth and 0 0.1 nanometer for the diameter of an atom. Question 4. Forces of 3.0 newtons and 4.0 newtons act at right angles to each other. Which forces produce a resultant force R in the direction shown? Is it A, B, C, or D? The answer is C. So this few diagrams is one of the methods that we determine the resultant force. This method is called the tip-to-tail method. So let's recall what is tip-to-tail method. So to use tip-to-tail method to identify the resultant force, the resultant force starts from the tail of the first vector and ends at the tip of the last vector. So from these four diagrams, C will be the correct answer where three newtons and four newtons are the acting uh, acting forces and to get the resultant force it start from the from the tail of the first vector and ends at the tip of the last vector so that's why the answer is c question five the velocity time graph shows the motion of an object during a period of 30 seconds what is the average speed of the object during this time period? A. 5.7 meters per second B. 6.0 meters per second C. 6.3 meters per second or D. 6.7 meters per second The answer is A. 5.7 meters per second So, to calculate the average speed, there is a formula which is the total distance traveled divided by the total time taken. So for a velocity time graph, to find the total distance traveled, it will be the area under the graph. So for average speed, then becomes area under graph divided by the total time taken. So the first thing we need to do for this question is we need to find the area under the graph from this velocity time graph. So from this diagram, I want to find the area of this shape first which is a trapezium so i apply the trapezium formula which is half times 10 plus 20 times 6. next i want to find the area of this shape which is also a trapezium and i apply the area of trapezium formula to get the area of this shape then i will get half times 6 plus 10 times 10 and then divided by the total time taken for this case is 30 seconds. So calculate everything, I'll get 170 divided by 30, which is about 5.7 meters per second, rounded up to the nearest one decimal place. Therefore, the answer is A, 5.7 meters per second. Question 6. A tennis player throws a ball vertically upwards as she prepares to hit the ball, as shown. Air resistance can be ignored. What is the acceleration of the ball just after it leaves her hand and at its highest point? So here are a few options. 
for acceleration just after leaving the hand and acceleration at its highest point. Is it A, 10 meters per second square downwards and zero? Or B, 10 meters per second square downwards and 10 meters per second square downwards? Or C, 10 meters per second square upwards and zero? Or D, 10 meters per second square upwards and 10 meters per second square downwards? The answer is B. 10 meters per second square downwards as the acceleration just after leaving hand and 10 meters per second square downwards as acceleration at its highest point. So let's look at this animation where the G is always pointing downwards. The G is the acceleration due to the gravity. And when it moves to the highest point and continue to move downwards, the direction of the G is always pointing downwards. Remember that gravitational acceleration constantly acts in downward direction on a mass. Question 7. A light ball is released from rest at the top of a very tall cliff. The ball falls through the air. Which statement describes the motion of the ball through its fall? A. It decelerates until it reaches terminal velocity. B. It speeds up until it reaches terminal velocity. C. It travels at a constant velocity from the top of the cliff until it hits the ground. Or D. Its acceleration is always equal to the acceleration of freefall. The answer is B. It speeds up until it reaches terminal velocity. Let's identify important keywords from this question. The first keyword is release. So it means that this is a free fall case. Next, from rest, which, me which means that the initial speed V0 is 0. The ball falls through the air which means we need to consider the air resistance. So this is a free fall case. Now let's draw the free body diagram for the ball with a mass of M. So it moves downwards with the acceleration of G equals 10 meters per second square. So this is the drying force FD, which is equals to MG. When it is falling downwards, there is a resistance to consider. So let's label this force as Fa. So it will have a resultant force, which is the drawing force Fd minus the air resistance Fa. So the things that you need to remember is that for free fall, the object constantly acceleration accelerates downwards at 10 meters per second square. So the drying force Fd will be equal to mg. So if this happens on Earth, it will be 10m. The higher the speed, the greater the air resistance, Fa. When it reaches the terminal velocity, the drying force Fd will be equal to the air resistance, Fa. Hence, the resultant force F will be equals to zero. Question eight. An object of mass 5.0 kilograms is initially at rest. The object is acted upon by a force of 10 newtons to the right. A frictional force of 5.0 newtons opposes the motion of the object. What is the acceleration of the object? Is it A, 1.0 meters per second square to the left, or B, 1.0 meters per second square to the right, or C, 2.0 meters per second square to the left, or D, 3.0 meters per second square to the right? The answer is B, 1.0 meters per second square to the right. So to get the answer for this question, let's draw out the free body diagram. 
So this object has a mass of 5 kg. It is initially at rest, which means the initial speed V0 is 0. So the object is acted upon by a force of 10 newtons to the right, which means this is the driving force FD is 10 newtons to the right. A frictional force of 5.0 newtons opposes the motion, so that means the frictional force is pointing to the left and the value is 5 newtons. So from here, we can calculate the resultant force F equals the drawing force FD minus the frictional force FR. So for this case, it's 10 minus 5, which we get positive 5 newtons. So let's update on the diagram. The resultant force F is pointing to the right. And we know that F equals to MA based on Newton's second law. So the acceleration is F over M. We have calculated the resultant force is 5 newtons and the mass given is 5 kilograms. Hence, acceleration is 5 over 5, which will get 1 meters per second squared. Question 9. Given this diagram, a model of a bird is placed on a pivot. The model is pushed sideways through a small distance. The model then swings from side to side repeatedly until it eventually stops in the position shown. In which position is the center of gravity of the model? The answer is C. So this question is testing the concept of center of gravity. What is the center of gravity? It is a point where the weight of the object acts on. Center gravity needs to be right above the pivot so that the model can balance on it. Hence, for this question, the answer is C. Question 10. Given these four choices, the diagram shows four objects of equal mass. The center of gravity of each object is labeled G. Which object is most stable? So the answer will be A. So this question again is testing about the stability. So in order to have an object to be most stable, it will have to be the lowest center of gravity and the widest base. Therefore, for this question, the answer is A. Question 11. A gas at a pressure of 25 newtons per centimeter square is contained in a cubical box with a volume of 64 centimeters cubed. What is the force exerted by the gas on one inner face of the box? A. 100 newtons B. 200 newtons C. 400 newtons or D. 1600 newtons the answer is C, 400 newtons. So this container is a cubical box. So let's draw a cube here. So a cube has all length which are equal. So the volume for a cube is L cube. So to get the length, it will be cube root of the volume. So for this case, we cube root 64 and the value for the length is 4 cm. The area of each side of the cube is L square. So for this case, it will be 4 square and the value is 16 cm square. To calculate the pressure, we apply the pressure formula P equals F over A. So, so from here, the force is the pressure times A. Given pressure is 25 and the area we have calculated, which is 16. So 25 times 16, the answer for the force will be 400 newtons. Question 12. The pressure due to a liquid of density 1200 kilograms per centimeters cube at a depth of 10 meters 
in the liquid is P. What is the pressure due to a second liquid of density 300 kg per centimeter cube at a depth of 80 meters? Is it A, P over 2, B, 2P, C, 4P, or D, 32P? The answer is B, 2P. So to get this answer, let's apply the formula to calculate the pressure of liquid. So the first liquid P1 equals rho 1 G H1, which is equals P as stated in the question. So the density of the first liquid is 1200, G is 10, and the height is 10 meters. We calculate the values, we get 120,000 Pascal. Next, we calculate the pressure for the second liquid P2 equals rho 2. G H2. So rho 2 is 300, G is 10, and the height is 80. So we calculate it, we get the answer 240,000 uh, 240, Pascal. So we compare pressure 2 and pressure 1, which is 240,000 divided by 120,000. So P2 over P1 equals 2. Therefore, P2 equals 2P1, which is 2P. Therefore, answer is B, 2P. Question 13. A train of 40,000 kg is moving along a straight track. The velocity of the train decreases from 30 meters per second to 25 meters per second. How much work is done to slow the train down? A. 1.0 times 10 to the power 5 joules B. 5.0 times 10 to the power 5 joules C. 5.5 times 10 to the power 6 joules or D. 1.1 times 10 to the power 7 joules The answer is C. 5.5 times 10 to the power 6 joules So to get this answer, we need to do some calculations We start from calculating the acceleration with this formula, A equals V minus U over T, where V is 25, which is the final speed, U is the initial speed, which is 30, and divided by the time T. So since the time is not given, we just leave it as T. So the acceleration will be negative 5 over T. Next, we go and calculate the displacement. So we use this formula, S equals UT plus half AT squared. So the U is 30, the A we calculated is negative 5 over T, and this equation becomes 30T plus half times negative 5 over T times T squared. Then we simplify, we get 30T minus 5 over T, which is 27.5T. Next, we want to calculate the force using this formula, F equals MA. So the mass for this train is 40,000 and the A we get is negative 5 over T. So 40,000 times negative 5 over T, we have negative 200,000 over T. Then lastly, we want to calculate the work done, which is F times S. So from this equation, the force, we don't have to include the negative sign because work done is a scalar quantity. Hence, we just take the magnitude of the force which is 200,000 over T, then times with the S, which is 27.5 T. So we simplify and calculate the value, we get 5 million and 500,000, which is changed to standard form 5.5 times 10 to the power of 6 joules. Hence, the answer is C. Question 14. A motor supplies 60 watt of power as it pulls a block at a steady speed along a horizontal bench. In 8.0 seconds, it pulls the block a distance of 3.0 meters. What is the frictional force between the block and the bench? A. 2.5 newtons B. 16 newtons C. 20 newtons or D. 160 newtons The answer is D, 160 newtons. So to understand this question, 
we can draw a body free body diagram so first we have a block and a motor on a rough surface so this motor provides 60 watts of power to pull the block the force that pull this block is the drying force FD and the frictional force will be opposite direction of the drying force this gives us the resultant force F the formula or the equation of the resultant force is F equals FD minus FR so we can start to do calculations here with the power formula P equals E over T where E is the energy and the T is the time so we can make E the subject then E equals P times T where P given is 60 watt and the time given is 8 seconds so the energy supplied by the motor will be 60 times 8 which is 480 joules so this energy is the work done to pull the block so the work done will be F times S and the value of work done is 480 the S is the displacement or distance traveled to when the block is pulled which is 3 meters therefore the force is 480 divided by 3 which is 160 newtons so this force is the drying force FD now the question states that this is a steady speed so steady speed means that the acceleration is zero so when acceleration is zero then the resultant force is zero because F equals ma then the equation becomes zero equals drying force minus frictional force which means the drying force equals to the frictional force and frictional force is 160 newtons question 15 a 5.0 watt of electric lamp is used for 8.0 hours per day for four weeks how much energy is transferred to the lamp a 1.1 times 10 to the power of 3 joules b 6.7 times 10 to the power of 4 joules c 5.8 times 10 to the power of 5 joules or d 4.0 times 10 to the power of 6 joules the answer is d 4.0 times 10 to the power of 6 joules so to calculate this value we start from the formula e equals pt which is the energy equals powers multiplied with the time so given the power is 5 watt or 5 joules per second and it is used for 8 hours notice that the time is in a different unit so we have to convert hours to seconds so we have 60 minutes per hours and 60 seconds per minute hours cancel with the hours minute cancel with the minute and second cancel with the second so at the end we'll get 5 times 8 times 60 times 60 which is 144,000 joules per day all right so don't stop here because this lamp is used for four weeks so this value is only telling us the amount of energy used a day so we have to multiply this value with four weeks and again the units for the time is different so one is day and another one is week we have to convert to the same unit so we know that there are seven days a week so now day day cancel with the day weeks cancel with the weeks so we have 144,000 times 4 times 7 which gives us 4 million and 32,000 joules and we can write it in standard form which is about 4.0 times 10 to the power of 6 joules hence the answer is D question 16 what is the correct order for the densities of these materials you have to arrange from lowest density to highest density a air aluminium water b air water aluminium c water a aluminium 
D. Water, aluminium, air. The answer is B. Air, water, aluminium. Alright, so this is a very straightforward question. The air is the gas, water is liquid, aluminium is solid. So lowest density will always be gas and the highest density will be solid. Therefore, answer is B. Question 17. Which process in the conduction of thermal energy occurs only in a metal conductor? A. Density changes within the material. B. Free electrons gaining kinetic energy through collisions with vibrating ions. C. Increase ionic vibration passing on to neighboring ions. D. Ions moving and passing on kinetic energy through collisions. The answer is B. Free electrons gaining kinetic energy through collisions within vibrating ions. So remember that all metals have electrons that move freely, while most non-metal materials do not have electrons that move freely. So therefore, for this question, the main idea is the metal conductor. So this is how metal conductor conduct thermal energy, which is by free electrons. So among these four choices, B is the best answer to describe how metal conductor transfer or conduct thermal energy. Question 18. Water at 0 degrees Celsius contracts as it is heated to 4 degrees Celsius. Three students make statements about water. Student 1. Convection currents do not occur in water between 0 degrees Celsius and 4 degrees Celsius. Student 2. As water cools from 4 degrees Celsius to 0 degrees Celsius, each molecule expands. Student 3. Water at 3 degrees Celsius sinks in water at 1 degree Celsius. Which students are correct? A. 1 only. B. 2 and 3. C. 2 only. Or D. 3 only. The answer is D. 3 only. So in other words, student 1 and student 2 statements are wrong. So what's wrong with their statements? Let's study one by one. We look at student 1. The statement is convection current do not occur in water between 0 degrees Celsius and 4 degrees Celsius. So this statement is wrong because convection currents occurs in fluids. Water is in liquid form between 0 degrees Celsius and 4 degrees Celsius. So convection currents flow from fluid with higher density to fluid with lower density. Then from here, as the question says, water at 0 degrees Celsius contracts as it is heated to 4 degrees Celsius. That means the density of water at 4 degrees Celsius is higher than its density at 0 degrees Celsius. So how about the statements for student 2? Students 2 state that as water cools from 4 degrees Celsius to 0 degrees Celsius, each molecule expands. So, Water molecules do not expand when temperature changes, but the spaces between the molecules change with temperature. Therefore, the statement for student 2 is incorrect. For student 3, the statement is correct. As mentioned from the question, right, water at 0 degrees Celsius contracts as it is heated to 4 degrees Celsius. When it contracts, the density gets higher. So, the density of water at 3 degrees Celsius is higher since it contracts than the density of water at 1 degree Celsius. Therefore, water at 3 degrees Celsius sinks in water at 1 degree Celsius. Question 19. A piece of metal and a piece of plastic are placed in a refrigerator for several hours. Why does the piece of metal feel colder than the piece of plastic? A. The metal is a better conductor of thermal energy than the plastic. B. 
The metal has a higher specific latent heat than the plastic. C. The metal has a lower heat capacity than the plastic. Or D. The metal is at a lower temperature than the plastic. The answer is A. The metal is a better conductor of thermal energy than the plastic. Alright, so as we have discussed in question 17, metals have free electron or the electrons that move freely compared to non-metal materials. So for this case, it's plastic. Therefore, it can transfer heat faster than plastic. Hence, metal is a better conductor of thermal energy than the plastic. And we, that's the reason we feel colder when we touch the metal compared to the plastic. Question 20. Which statement about the energy of an object is not correct? A. A thermometer measures the internal energy of an object. B. The internal energy of an object can be increased by doing work on the object. C. The internal energy of an object is a measure of the total energy of its particles. D. When the temperature of an object increases, the average kinetic energy of its particles increases. The answer is A. A thermometer measures the internal energy of an object. So I would say A. The answer is partially correct. So what's the reason? Let's recap first before I can explain. So the internal energy consists of potential energy and kinetic energy. So the temperature of a material changes when its kinetic energy changes. While the material will change the state between solid, liquid and gas when its potential energy changes. Therefore, for question for answer A, thermometer measures the internal energy, which is very, very generic. It should be measuring the kinetic energy because we are measuring the temperature. Okay, as we over here, temperature state uh, when temperature change, the kinetic energy change. Right. So the next one, internal energy is can be increased by doing work on the object. So in other words, we are supplying energy to the object. Then the internal energy of the object will increase. Next one, C. Internal energy of an object is a measure of total energy of its particles. All right. So this statement also correct because we talk about total energy means the potential energy and the kinetic energy add together gives us the internal energy. The next one, D, when the temperature of object increases, average kinetic energy also increases. Okay, so as we have stated here, the second point, when temperature changes, the kinetic energy also changes. Hence, D is correct. Answer is A. Question 21. An ion container of mass 2.0 kg needs 9,000 joules of thermal energy to increase its temperature from 25 degrees Celsius to 35 degrees Celsius. What is the heat capacity of the container? A. 450 joules per degree Celsius. B. 900 joules per degree Celsius. C. 4,500 joules per degree Celsius. Or D. 90,000 joules per degree Celsius. So the answer is B. 900 joules per degree Celsius. So how can we calculate this value? We start with the formula of heat capacity, C equals Q over delta theta. So the Q is the energy supply and the delta theta is the change of the temperature. So the energy supply is 9000, which is given at the change of temperature from 25 degrees Celsius to 35 degrees Celsius. Therefore, delta theta will be 35 minus 25. We calculate the value, we get 900 joules per degree Celsius. So B will be the answer. Question 22. An immersion heater of power 50 watt is placed in 0 0.40 kg of a liquid. The specific heat capacity of this liquid is 2.0 joules per grams per degree Celsius. The initial temperature of the liquid is 25 degrees Celsius. 
the heater is turned on for 0 0.80 minutes and the liquid is gently stirred. All of the energy supplied by the heater is transferred into the liquid. The liquid does not reach its boiling point. What is the final temperature of the liquid? A. 22 degrees Celsius B. 28 degrees Celsius C. 50 degrees Celsius or D. 75 degrees Celsius The answer is B. 28 degrees Celsius So to get this value, we need to do some calculations. We start with calculating the energy supplied by using this formula E equals PT. The power of the heater is given 50 watts and the time is 0 0.8 minutes and the time is 60 to change to seconds and the energy supply is 2400 joules. Considering that there is no energy loss, then we can use the specific heat capacity formula Q equals to MC delta theta. So the change of the temperature delta theta equals Q over MC. So the delta theta will be the final temperature which we want to find, theta, minus the initial temperature which is 35 degrees Celsius equals the Q or the energy supply is 2400 joules divided by the mass is 0 0.4 kg. We have to convert it into grams because the specific heat capacity 2.0 joules it is in grams per grams per degree Celsius. So this is grams, therefore 0 0.4 kg will convert to grams which is 400. So be careful with the unit here. The C given is 2 here, 2 joules per grams per degree Celsius. Then we calculate everything here. The theta will be 3 plus 25 which is 28 degree Celsius. Therefore answer is B. Question 23. A liquid can change into a gas by boiling or, or by evaporation. Which row is correct? So we compare between a change that occurs only at the surface of the liquid and a change that occurs only at one particular temperature. So the option A is boiling, boiling. B, boiling evaporation. C, evaporation boiling or D evaporation evaporation the answer is C evaporation and boiling remember that evaporation happens at any temperature and only at the surface of the liquid on the other hand boiling happens at only boiling temperature for example, water at 100 degrees Celsius, and it happens throughout the whole liquid. Therefore, answer is C. Question 24. Which statement concerning wave motion is correct? A. Waves transfer energy without the transfer of matter. B. Waves transfer matter without the transfer of energy. C. Wave travel always occurs in the direction of the particle vibration. D. Wave travel always occurs in a direction at right angles to the particle vibration. The answer is A. Waves travel energy without the transfer of matter. So remember that the wave only transfer energy but it does not transfer the matter because the particles of the matter vibrates at fixed position. Okay, so for statement B, it is the opposite of statement A. Therefore, the statement B is incorrect. For statement C, there are two types of waves, which is transverse waves and the longitudinal wave. So for C, it is actually the transverse waves, but not all the waves occurs in the direction of the particle vibration. Similarly, for T, it is the longitudinal waves, but not all the waves occurs in the direction at right angles to the particle vibration. Hence, statements C and D are incorrect as well. 
equation 25 given this diagram a stone is dropped into a pond at O and circular crests spread out from O the distance from P to Q is 12 cm the crests travel at a distance that is equal to 8 wavelengths in 4.0 seconds what is the wavelength and the frequency of the waves so we need to calculate wavelengths in cm and frequency in hertz a 3.0 0 0.50 b 3.0 and 2.0 c 4.0 and 0 0.50 or d 4.0 and 2.0 the answer is d wavelength is 4.0 cm and frequency is 2.0 hertz now let's zoom bigger for the portion where we have point P and point Q. So given that the distance between P and Q is 12 cm, and between P and Q, there are 1, 2, 3 gaps. So we can plot this into a waveform and we can see the picture clearer. So this is point P. This is point Q. Between these two points, the distance is 12 cm. So the distance between peak to peak of the wave is the wavelength lambda. So there are three lambdas. Therefore, to calculate the wavelength lambda, you will be 12 cm divided by 3, which is 4 cm. Next, to calculate the frequency, the question tells us that the crest travel at a distance that is equal to 8 wavelengths in 4 seconds. So I want to calculate uh, the time for one wavelength, So, which is the period T is 4.0 seconds divided by 8 wavelengths. We have 0.5 seconds for the period. Therefore, we can calculate the frequency F equals 1 over T which is 1 over 0 0.5, we get 2.0 hertz. Question 26. Given this diagram, a ray of light in a glass block strikes the surface of the block and undergoes total internal reflection. Through which angle does the direction of the ray change as it strikes the surface? A. 35 degrees B. 70 degrees C. 110 degrees D. 125 degrees The answer is B. 70 degrees To get this value, so let's look at the diagram first. This angle, which is the incident angle, is 55 degrees because based on the law of reflection, incident angle equals reflected angle. So since the reflected angle is 55 degrees, then the incident angle will be 55 degrees as well. Next, if there is no surface between the glass and the air, the incident ray will continue to move in a straight line. This angle will be 55 degrees because mathematically, this angle is the vertical opposite angle, hence it is 55 degrees. So next we want to get this angle. So since the normal is perpendicular with the surface, then to calculate this angle, it will be 90 degrees minus 55 degrees, which gives us 35 degrees. Similarly, this angle also can be calculated by 90 degrees minus 55 degrees, which gives us 35 degrees. Now, since there is a surface between the glass and the air, then the incident ray will be reflected into the reflected ray. So this is the angle where the ray changed the direction. So this angle is 35 degrees plus 35 degrees, which gives us 70 degrees. Question 27. 
statements 1 and 2 refer to signals passing through an optical fiber of refractive index 1.5. Statement 1. The speed of the signal in the optical fiber is 3.0 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. Statement 2. There is less signal loss in the optical fiber than in copper cable. Which statements are correct? A. Neither of the statements. B. Both statements 1 and 2. C. Statement 1 only. Or D. Statement 2 only. The answer is D. Statement 2 only. Alright, so why is statement 1 is incorrect? The speed of signal in optical fiber is not 3.0 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second because this speed is a speed of light when it travels in vacuum. Alright, so in vacuum there is no resistance, therefore it can travel at this speed. But if it travels in optical fiber and it has a refractive index of 1.5, which means it is optically denser than the air or the vacuum, therefore the speed travel in optical fiber will be slower, which means it is less than 3.0 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second. And for statement 2, it is correct. That's the reason where we will prefer to use optical fiber than the copper cable as it has less signal loss. Question 28. A thin converging lens has a focal length of 16 cm. An object is placed at four different positions in front of the lens. How far from the lens is the object when the image produced is real and magnified? A. 12 cm B. 20 cm, C. 32 cm, or D. 40 cm. The answer is B. 20 cm. So to explain this answer, we need to recall a few concepts about thin converging lens. So first will be the thin lens formula, which is 1 over u plus 1 over v equals to 1 over f, where u is the distance between the object and the lens, V is the distance between the image and the lens, and F is the focal length. So there are a few cases that we need to consider. The first case is when the U is between 0 and F, and the V is less than 0. So for this case, the image form is virtual, upright, and magnified. Also, image form is same side and behind the object. Application is magnifying glass. The second case is when u is equals f and the v is at infinity. For this case, image form is virtual, upright, and magnified. Image is at infinity. One common application is spotlight projecting parallel beam. The third case is when u is between f and 2f while the v is greater than 2f. For this case, image is real, inverted, and magnified, and image is at opposite side of the lens. The applications for this case is projector and microscope. The fourth case is when u equals 2f, v is also equals 2f. For this case, image form is real, inverted, and same size as object. Image is at opposite side of the lens. The application is the photocopier machine. Next, the fifth case is when u is greater than 2f and v is between f and 2f. For this case, image form is real, inverted, and diminished, and image is at opposite side of the lens. Some common applications for this case are camera and human eyes. Next, the sixth case will be when u is at infinity and v equals to f. So for this case, image is real, inverted, and diminished. Image is at opposite side of the lens. The application for this case is telescope. Now let's go back to this question. The question states that 
the image produced is real and magnified. Therefore, it is the third case, where the U is between F and 2F. So, for this case, the F is 16 cm, so 2F will be 32 cm. Therefore, U must be between 16 and 32 cm, hence the answer is B, 20 cm. The rest of the values are not in this range. Question 29. Which region of the electromagnetic spectrum is used for communication with satellites? A. Infrared B. Microwaves C. Visible light or D. X-rays The answer is B. Microwaves Infrared can be used in remote control, thermal imaging and motion detector. For microwaves, it can be used in microwave oven, satellite communications and remote sensing. Visible light can be used in optical fiber, camera and endoscopy, while X-rays can be used in luggage scanner, radiography for medical usage, crack detection in pipes and buildings. Question 30. A sound reaches a man through two different routes. The first route is through water. The second route is an equal distance through air. The speed of sound in the air is 340 meters per second and the speed of the sound in water is 1,500 meters per second. The man first hears the sound 0 0.50 seconds after the sound is emitted. How long after first hearing the sound does he hear the sound a second time? A. 0 0.11 seconds B. 0 0.61 second C. 1.7 second or D. 2.2 second The answer is C. 1.7 seconds To explain this question, first let's look at this diagram. This is the sound source. It travels at two channel, one is for the water and the second is the air. So in the water, the speed of the sound is 1500 meters per second. The time traveled is 0 0.50 seconds. With this information and we apply the speed formula V equals to D over T, we can calculate the distance, which is T equals to the speed multiplied with the time. The speed is 1500 and the time is 0 0.5 seconds. Therefore, the distance will be 750 meters. Next, for the second route by air, the speed of the sound through the air is 340 meters per second. Since it is equal distance, therefore, the distance is also 750 meters. Using the same formula of speed v equals to d over t and the information that we have calculated here we can calculate the time taken to travel through the air which is d over v so the distance is 150 meters and the speed is 340 meters per second therefore the time will be 2.2 seconds but this is not the answer yet because this is only the time that the sound travels through the air but we want to find how long after first hearing the sound does he hear the sound a second time so in other words we need to find the time difference which is the time for the second route minus the time for the first route so it's 2.2 minus 0 0.5 which is 1.7 seconds Question 31. Three charge rods are freely suspended as shown. Which statement is correct? A. The force of attraction between P and Q is stronger than the force of repulsion between Q and S. B. The force of attraction between P and Q is weaker than the force of repulsion between Q and S. C. 
the force of repulsion between P and Q is stronger than the force of attraction between Q and S. D. The force of repulsion between P and Q is weaker than the force of attraction between Q and S. The answer is B. The force of attraction between P and Q is weaker than the force of repulsion between Q and S. So this statement is correct. The rest is incorrect. Why is it so? So we have to think carefully two points. The first is whether they attract or repel. Remember that unlike charges attract and like charges repel. So for this case, PQ will attract because they are unlike charges. P is positively charged and Q is negatively charged. Q and S will repel because both of them are negatively charged. So let's look at option C and D. Both of the statements say, stated that there is a repulsion between P and Q and there is an attraction between Q and S. So they are incorrect. The next point we need to think about is whether the attraction or repulsion is weaker or stronger. So how to determine? It is determined by the distance. The longer the distance, the weaker the force. Similarly, the shorter the distance, the stronger the force. So for the first case, P and Q, they have longer distance. Therefore, the force between them is weaker. Q and S, they have shorter distance. Therefore, the force between them is stronger. Now, let's compare option A and B. So, for option A, the force of attraction between P and Q is stronger, which is incorrect because they are longer distance. So, they should be weaker for the force of attraction between P and Q. Therefore, only B statement is correct. Question 32. The diagram shows the pattern of the electric field surrounding two isolated point charges. What are the charges on X and Y? Charge on X, charge on Y. Option A, negative, negative. Option B, negative, positive. Option C, positive, negative or option D, positive, positive? The answer is A, negative, negative. To answer this question, there are two points we need to think carefully. The first point is whether attract or repel. We know that unlike charges attract and like charges repel. Based on the diagram, both charges repel. Hence, X and Y are same charge. Therefore, option B and option D are incorrect. The next point we need to think about is the direction of electric field. Negative charge, the point, the direction of electric field will point into the charge. For the positive charge, it will point out from the charge. Based on the diagram, all the electric fields are pointing towards the charges. Hence, both charge on X and Y are negative. Therefore, the answer is A. Question 33. A negatively charged copper sphere rests on an insulating mat, as shown in this diagram. A negatively charged plastic rod is brought near to the copper sphere. Which diagram shows the charge distribution on the sphere? As you look at the option A, in the sphere, all the negative charge are gathered in the right hand side of the sphere. For the B, we have negative charge on the right hand side and positive charge on the left hand side. And for both sides, they have equal number of the positive and the negative charges. For C, there are some negative charges on the left hand side and some on the right hand side. There are also some positive charges on the right hand side. For D, there are positive charges on the left hand side and negative charges on the right hand side. And you can see that the negative charges are more than the positive charges. So which options for this question? The answer is D. Okay, so the reason is here we have to think carefully. 
First, the negative charges on the left hand side of the sphere are repelled to the right hand side. So why? Because the rod here is negative charge, right? We know light charges will repel. So they will repel to the right hand side. Leaving positive charges on the left hand side. So from here, that means the A is incorrect and the C is also incorrect. So it's possible to be B and D. But as you can compare, for B, both positive charge and negative charges, they have the same number. And for D, negative charges is more than the positive charges. So why is this? The answer should be D. Why is this so? Because more negative charges on the right side of the sphere as the sphere is negatively charged. As you can see at the beginning, this sphere is negative charged. In other words, we have more negative charge on the right side. Question 34. A circuit diagram of a torch is shown. The torch is switched on for 4.0 minutes and the current in the circuit is 2.0 ampere. How many charges pass through point P in the circuit and in which direction do the electrons flow in the circuit? Here are a few options for a charge in column and the direction. A. 8.0 anticlockwise B. 8.0 clockwise C. 480 anticlockwise D. 480 clockwise The answer is D. 480 clockwise To calculate the charge, we can use the formula Q equals to IT Given that the current is 2 amps and the time is 4 minutes we have to multiply by 60 because we need to convert the time into seconds. Therefore, it will be 480 columns. Next, to determine the direction of the electron flow, remember that conventional currents flow from positive terminal to negative terminal and the electron flow in the opposite direction of convex conventional currents. So from this uh, diagram, this blue arrow shows the conventional current and this red arrow shows the electron flow. Therefore, for this question, answer is D. Question 35. What is the definition of the potential difference PD across a component? A. The charge passing through the component in unit time. B. The current in the component divided by the resistance of the component. C. The work done to drive an electron through the component. Or D. The work done to drive unit charge through the component. The answer is D. The work done to drive unit charge through the component. So this is a very textbook based question. And this which is the definition of potential difference and the D is the answer. Question 36. Given this diagram, a battery is connected to a real state. The total resistance of the real state is 20 ohms. The resistance of the section XY of the real state is 6.0 ohms and the resistance of the lamp is 6.0 ohms. What is the total resistance of the circuit? A. 17 ohms, B, 23 ohms, C, 26 ohms, or D, 32 ohms. The answer is A, 17 ohms. To get this answer, we can redraw the circuit into this equivalent circuit, where the resistance of section XY is 6 ohms, and the resistance of the lamp is 6 ohms. The resistance at the top will be the remaining resistance of the real state, which is 20 minus 6, we we'll get 14 ohms. From this circuit, notice that these two resistance are connected in parallel. Therefore, we can calculate the equivalent resistance using the parallel resistance formula. 1 over R equivalent equals 1 over 6 plus 1 over 6. Hence, the R equivalent will be 6 over 2, which is 3 ohms. 
now we can redo again this circuit into this diagram where the 14 ohms is connected in series with the 3 ohms since they are connected in series then the total resistance is just adding these two resistance 14 plus 3 which is 17 ohms hence answer is a 17 ohms question 37 given this diagram the resistance of a cylindrical wire p is 80 ohms a second wire q is made from the same material the radius of q is twice the radius of p the length of q is twice the length of p what is the resistance of q a 40 ohms b 80 ohms c 160 ohms or d 640 ohms the answer is a 40 ohms to calculate the resistance we can use the formula r equals rho l over a so let's talk about the resistance of wire p which is rho l over pi r square so rp is 80 which is given therefore 80 equals to rho l over pi r square next we will calculate the resistance for wire q rq since the length is double the length of the wire p the l becomes 2l and the radius is twice the radius of p therefore it is over pi bracket 2r square so expand the bracket we get 2 rho l over 4 pi r square which is half times rho l over pi r square the rho l over pi r square is 80 therefore it is half times 80 and we get 40 ohms hence answer is a 40 ohms <coughs> question 38 a 6.0 volt battery is connected to three resistors and an emitter as shown the reading on the emitter is 0 0.30 amps there is a potential difference pd of 2.0 volt across resistor r1 what is the current at x and the pd across r3 so here are the few options for current at x in ampere the pd across r3 in volts so a 0 0.10 2.0 b 0 0.10 and 4.0 c 0 0.30 2.0 and d 0 0.30 and 4.0 the answer is d 0 0.30 amps for current and x and 4.0 volts for the pd across r3 so given that the reading on the emitter is 0.3 amps then ix will be equals to 0.3 amps as well because current connected in series is the same next given that the pd across r1 is 2.0 volts then i want to calculate the pd across r3 since v1 and v2 are connected in series then v1 plus v2 equals to 6 volts which is the voltage of the battery the v1 is 2 then the equations becomes 2 plus v2 equals to 6 hence v2 equals to 4 volts question 39 an electric heater is connected to the main supply using a 3-pin plug. What is the correct position in the circuit for the switch of the heater? A. Between the earth pin and the heating element. B. Between the earth pin and the neutral pin. C. Between the life pin and the heating element. Or D. Between the neutral pin and the heating element. So the answer will be C, between the life pin and the heating element. Alright, so this question is a very straightforward question. For safety reason, we always connect the switch between the life pin and the heating element. Question 
Question 40. The input voltage to a transformer in a power station is 3000 volts. The efficiency of the transformer is 100%. There is a current of 8.0 amps in the input coil. There are 1000 turns on the input coil. The output voltage of the transformer is 120,000 volts. How many turns are on the output coil and what is the current in the output coil? So here are a few options for turns on output coil and current in output coil in ampere. A. 40,000, 0 0.20 B. 40,000, 320 C. 360,000, 0 0.20 or D 360,320 The answer is A 40,000 turns on output coil and 0 0.20 amps for current in output coil So here is the calculation We use the transformer formula VP over VS equals NP over NS So given that the voltage on the primary is 3000 and the voltage on the secondary is 120,000 volts. The number of coils in the primary is 1000 and divided by NS. So 3000 over 120,000 equals 1000 over NS. So calculate the NS which is 1000 times 120,000 divided by 3000. We get 40,000 turns on the secondary or the output coil. Since this is 100% efficiency transformer, then the power in the primary equals to the power in the secondary. Hence, VPIP equals VSIS. So we can substitute all the values that we know. VP is 3000, IP is 8, VS is 120,000, then we can calculate IS. Therefore, IS will be 3000 times 8 divided by 120,000 which is 0 0.2 ampere. Therefore, answer is A. Alright, that's the end of the paper and that's all for this video. Thanks for watching. Do you have any question or doubts to ask? Feel free to write it down in the comment. I would love to hear from you. Do you like this video? Please don't forget to like it and share it with your friends. Support me. If my videos benefit you in your learning, you can treat me a cup of coffee. To do this, link is at the description area. Until then, see you in the next video. Have a great day ahead and all the best.